good morning as you make your way back to your seats. Please join along with us as we sing, God is for us. passage from Hebrews chapter 4 uh, about Jesus, our great high priest. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, that's just such an encouraging uh, passage uh, talking about what Christ has done, that he is our high priest. He intercedes for us. And because of him and because of what he did for us, uh, living the perfect life, we could not live dying on the cross, being buried, and rose from the dead we are now able to be adopted as children. So we can, with confidence, go before God and ask for mercy, ask for grace. We all need that daily. And so um, this next song we're singing, His Mercy is More, uh, just another example that uh, no matter when we look at our lives and where we've failed and how we've sinned, um, God's mercy is greater. 
And so wherever you come from, if you're a, a believer and you can look back and see how God has uh, shown his grace and mercy to you, we praise God for that. If you're uh, searching and you, you think, I have, I've sinned too much, I'm, I've gone too far astray, God can't save me, he can. His mercy is greater than any and all of our sins. So let's uh, praise God for that this morning as we sing. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that's our desire, that you abide with us. Not that we just have one day a week uh, to worship you and go on with our life, but that you are in our life all the time. We, uh, you, your spirit dwells in us and reminds us of your grace, your love, your mercy, and just causes us to rejoice, uh, to praise you that when we go through anything, you're right there with us. We just automatically speak to you through prayer. God, we want your abiding presence with us now and always. And we thank you that through Christ, we have that assurance that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So we praise you and thank you for the promises in your word that uh, help us through this life. And we pray that as we uh, start to focus on uh, hearing from your word, we pray that you will just open our ears, open our hearts to receive the message you have for us and that we will rejoice all the more that you have given us your words so that we may know you, that we may know how to serve and please you more. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, if you would, we're going to turn to Galatians 5. 16 through 24 for this morning's reading. (laughs) 
But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this word, for the scripture that you have that you have given me and the pen, Lord, that we get to read a lot can be overcome. And as we heard from Pastor Matt last week, when we look at verse 17, this idea of four, when he begins with four, he says, well, let me explain. He says, you know, you, you have this power over the flesh and you won't satisfy it. Well, let me tell you how and why. He says, for the flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things you please. So the reason they needed the spirit was because of this conflict. There is a conflict, he says, between the flesh and the spirit. They have different paths for you to travel. Different goals in mind, different purposes. Uh, some translations actually say the lust of the flesh. Um, but this does not necessarily only mean sexual uh, nature. It's not, it's not meant that. The Greek word translated as flesh is sarx. And Paul uses it not as a reference to flesh and blood, but to the sinful nature of and the fallen state of man. So this idea of flesh is the sinful nature. It is, it is what draws us uh, to, as we heard in the song, to leave the Lord who loves us, right? Martin Luther said it this way. He says, I do not deny that the lust of the flesh includes carnal lust. And we're going to see a list of things here soon that, that we'll, we'll talk about. He said, but it takes in more. It takes all the corrupt desire with which believers are more or less infected as pride, hatred, covetousness, and impatience. One of the commentaries I read refers to flesh this way. It says, all the evil that one is capable of, uh, capable of apart from the intervention of God's grace in one's life. Think about that. Let me, let me read that again to you. The flesh here, as Paul is, is, is referring to this conflict, is all the evil that one is capable of apart from the intervention of God's grace in one's life. What we do know is as believers, we've been given a new heart. We've been, we are, we've been made a new creation. And, and sin no longer rules in our life. But as we heard in the song where his mercy is more, it says our sins are many. We have not stopped sinning. We don't um, we don't we don't we don't we don't sin we are not sinless. We do sin less. And so we live in the presence of sin and are susceptible to temptations of those sin. We see that in Paul's letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where he says there is no temptation that's not common to man. But what does he say? He said God provides a way out. As we are walking by the Spirit, we are looking for that way out when those temptations come. 
Our desire is not to sin. Our desire is to follow the Spirit. Uh, and he says in verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What a, what a joyous statement there. Think about that. He says if, if they are walking by the Spirit, they are led by the Spirit, they are not under the law. And we think about the argument for the law, it's weak. As we heard last week, Israel had been under that for a long time. And it didn't work and hinder their sin. Romans 8, 3 through 4 tells us that very thing. With by living with a power, um, you know, when we think about the law and the, and the weakness it is. And the power of the Spirit to give us the restraint now not to sin. Uh, in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, he said, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his, son, his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So this is his desire for us to walk and be led by the Spirit. So how would they know? How would they know whether they were led by the Spirit or by the, by the flesh? Well, Paul's going to address that in his next in the next passage here in verses 19 through 24. And we're gonna we're gonna break that out into two sessions. Uh, two, two different parts here. 19 through 21, which will be the acts of the flesh and the consequences. And 22 through 24, the fruit of the Spirit and its results. Verses 19 through 21, he says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. So Paul is going to identify the evidence of the sinful nature in their life. And he says they are evident. Now, this doesn't mean that you're just going to be able to see this with your eyes as far as in someone else's life. But in your life, these things will be evident to you if the flesh is at work in your life. They work those deeds. And he compiles a list of these. Now, the one thing we'll look, as we look at this list, uh, know that this list is not an exalted list. He even says that at the end where he says, and things like these. So, But he, he does bring a list up for, for them, and we'll look at those. And we're going to group these together. Uh, as I study this week, a lot of the uh, scholars all group these together, so I don't see any need to be do this differently. So let's look at him. He says, uh, the, flet, the, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, Enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. So the first group we're going to group together are sexual sins. Uh, sexual immorality or fornication, impurity or uncleanliness, sensuality, uh, some translations will say licentiousness or lewdness. Uh, the idea here is sex outside of marriage. You know, our pastor said a, little, you know, a week or two ago, it's not try it before you like it. Uh, so many people now want to see if they're compatible sexually before they get married. Uh, and God's, God's clear in his word that that is not the case that it should be. He also says this marriage should be between a man and a woman, male and female, biologically. Uh, let's don't mince words here. We are under attack, God's word is under attack, to uh, really the way the foundation is made. God said he made them male and female. He said marriage is between a husband and a wife. And a husband is male and a wife is female. So these, and then when you think about sensuality, uh, lewdness and those things, this, this is an idea of indecency where they do these things having no shame. No shame in these sexual sins. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I missed one. Impurity. When you think about uh, what he said up there, he, said, he talked about 
um, impurity, and that is the idea of, of moral uncleanliness cleanliness in our thought life. It's how we think. What are we, what are we thinking about daily? Are we thinking about things that are above, as Scripture tells us? Things, are we focused on here and now, the temporal? So the second thing he has here is considered religious sins. Um, and these were really associated with heathen, religion, heathen religions, you know, idolatry, sorcery, some say witchcraft. Uh, the idolatry is really bowing down to pagan gods. It is worshiping something other than the real God. Things that were made by hand. And then the other is, is using magic potions to control evil powers. When you think about sorcery and witchcraft and black magic, those things, uh, the occult. It is pagan religion. Then he groups things in as personal sins, uh, relational sins, things that happen between one another. Enmities or hatred, some translations will say. Strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. Loving others is not easy, is it? Because these are evident when we're in the flesh and they create conflict with one another the other is considered social sins uh, these have to do with uh, drinking when you hear drunkenness and carousing some, some will say orgies is the translation it really is a, a, a pagan culture that uh, was associated with Bacchus, the god of wine that, that Paul is referring to here and, and, and really giving them a stern warning when these are practiced. Paul says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I've got to pause here and, and, and just ask a question here. Paul, Paul, is Paul trying to say one can lose their salvation here? Because he says those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if someone falls into one of these sins, are they, are they in jeopardy? No, I don't mean to know. That's not what Paul is saying. He says if you practice these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, so the Bible is clear. We heard that in, when we were singing, that God's mercy is more, it's greater than all our sins. So we still sin. So it is not, that is not what he means. Uh, 1 John 1, 8 says, even says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we do sin. The idea is, are we living in that sin? Are we turning from that sin? Are we relying on the power of the Spirit to guide us away from that? Uh, 1 John 3, 4 through 6, he really kind of, John talks about that. He said, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. So Paul is talking about a perpetual act of sin. No repentance, no remorse. Maybe if you're caught, turning from it. It's the same thing with salvation. When we were saved, when you were saved, you repented, you turned from sin, and you turned to God. And that's what Paul is saying here, is this sin cannot be lived in or you won't inherit the kingdom of God. So let's look at next, with the spirit, the fruit of the Spirit and, and its results. And this is, we will look at these individually as we look at the, the deeds of the flesh as a group, but we'll look at these individually. Um, and, and let's read this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, 
against such things there is no law. So Paul is going to now contrast the life lived in the flesh with the life lived by the Spirit. A life lived by the Spirit produces fruit. There is evidence here. It is recognizable as well. The fruit is produced by the Holy Spirit's ministry in the life of a believer. They are there. They, they will come forth. Um, and it's, it's fitting that love begins is the very first one. Um, I, there's no doubt the reason why it's mentioned first. We know God is love. We've, we've talked about that. And, and it's not, we don't want to misconstrue the way the world takes it as love. But let's listen to what he said when asked about the greatest commandment in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Uh, trying to trip Jesus up, he says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. And he said, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Love is the first one listed for a purpose. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three. We're saying about, you know, asking the Lord to abide in us, right? And he says he wants these three to abide in us. He says, but the greatest of these is love. So without love, it all falls apart in the Christian life. So those, we're going to group joy and peace together, uh, though we'll talk about them a little bit differently. But joy and peace, when you look in the New Testament, oftentimes the, the writer, that's the first thing he does in a greeting, he says joy and peace to you, right? Uh, and, and joy is like happiness, but does not appear uh, disappear based on circumstance as happiness does. And to give you the picture of this, think of Paul and Silas sitting in a jail, praising and worshiping God, right? They're in jail. They've been thrown in jail for speaking the gospel. And now, and causing a ruckus, and now they're worshiping God in jail. That's joy. That's joy that's not fleeting. And peace, peace is a gift. God as well that, that was achieved on the cross and it is a practical peace between one another as we think about the spirit it is in each one of us that are have been purchased by Christ therefore we have peace with one another and Peter says that believers should strive for peace this should be something that we should strive for. Now, the next one, there will be some folks that might, may not like this one, patience. And I'm just going to tell you, yes, you should pray for patience. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. And unlike, when we think about this list, unlike the gifts of the Spirit, you may not have every gift, you do have every fruit. So you can't say God didn't give me the fruit of patience. It's there because the Spirit's inside of the believer. So patience, you should pray for patience. You know, we think about it, God, and this is a, um, a picture of God. We sang it in, in um, one of the songs earlier, too, about God was patiently waiting for us. Uh, he is long-suffering, and it describes the character of God. And this is who we belong to and who the Spirit is conforming us to the image of Christ. And so patience is there. You may have to cultivate it. You may need to be asking for the Spirit's help, repenting when, it's, when you do not have patience. But it's, it's part of the fruit of the Spirit, and it is inside each believer. Kindness. Kindness it, it's what the Old Testament kind of meant when it said God is good right? God is good that's the kindness of God that he is good uh, and this goodness is closely related to kindness uh, the only really difference is that goodness is more about the idea of generosity that 
that's why they go together. It springs from kindness, as goodness does. Faithfulness, being reliable and trustworthy. A commentary I read, it said, the ability to serve God faithfully through the years and through the temptations of life is not something we achieve by heroic virtue. It comes from the Spirit. And I, every one of us pray one day we get to hear from God the Father, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of my rest. That's the faithfulness. Gentleness is closely related to meekness. It is not having a superior attitude, uh, but always being teachable. No matter how much you've been in church year after year after year, hearing God's word, we must always remain teachable. And that's the, that's the gentleness inside of us. Um, Self-control. Self-control, we get, a lot, we get to hear a lot about that. We're bombarded, bombarded with that in our culture. Uh, to, 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 you know, we see athletes, right? They, they discipline themselves to be ready to play in games. They will sacrifice greatly for that. That is not, that is more focused on a selfish reason. You might think of your team, that you want to be a good teammate. But this self-control is more also, not just for yourself, but is related as we relate to others and thinking of them as well. And then we see the statement right after self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, this is probably a rhetorical statement here as uh, giving you that, that effect because the law, uh, Paul has said, was given for the restraint of evil. But these qualities, there is no restraint on these qualities, right? They don't need to be restrained, and hence the law has no, does not oppose them. You think about it, it's when we consider freedom in Christ, what we find is that the fruit of the Spirit is actually in harmony with the law. While we know we're not under it, it's not opposed to the law either. And this is why earlier you heard in Galatians, Paul would say, if we love one another, we have fulfilled the law. And, and you heard that in Romans 8 as well, verses 3 and 4, that that is, that is a fulfillment of the law but through love. So as we consider this conflict between the flesh and the spirit, We can see this fruit is evident. It gives us evidence that we are also abiding in Christ. John 15, 1 through 5, a very familiar passage. Um, he says, I am, the vine, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus says in John's gospel, if you belong to him and abide in him, you will bear much fruit. We saw what that fruit looks like, right? We saw what Paul says that fruit looks like. And when we walk in the spirit, we give the evidence that we are abiding in Christ. And he says those who belong to Christ, 
have crucified the flesh. Along with his passions and desires. Remember in a Bible study with Mr. Bill Algy in there, he was talking about this example of being dead to sin, being crucified to the flesh, and how there is no influence because a dead person doesn't move. So there is no draw when we crucify the flesh. So when you think about this, we're about to close, and, and I want to give you a picture. I was listening to Alistair Begg uh, a few weeks ago, and, and he, he said something that I thought, the first time I heard it, now maybe not the first time you've heard it, but the first time I heard it, and he was careful to, he didn't know who, who he'd heard it from, but he was very careful to, to say that it, he, somebody else said it. It wasn't something that, that he thought of. But he says you take the word flesh, you drop the H, and reverse the spelling. So you have S-E-L-F, self. So that is the battle with the flesh. It's the battle of self. It's the focus on self instead of where the spirit has us focused on Christ. So does that sound a little bit like what Christ has commanded us to do? Yeah, Matthew 16, 24, he said, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So I want to encourage you if you're here today. Take some time, examine yourself to see if this fruit is in you. To see if there is some that you may need to cultivate. Uh, Paul, in his, Paul in his letter to his uh, second letter to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. Peter also gives this. In 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11, he says, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, now these things he's talking about are the virtues in verses 5 through 8 that build upon one another. He says, if you practice those things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Jesus, Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Remember, he said, if you are practicing the deeds of the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I want to encourage you um, to know that you've been, as a believer, you've been given the spirit, the power to live this out. In First Peter, in 2 Peter 1, he says we've been, through his divine power, we've been granted everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything we need. So the spirit, we've been given the spirit, so these should be evident in our life. And we, we finish where he says in verse 25, he says, live by the spirit and keep in step with the spirit. So Paul is really emphasizing how the Galatians will live out this new freedom. It is only by the spirit. So the question here is, what is leading you, the flesh, or who is leading you, the spirit? For those of you who may be here and say, I don't see the works of the spirit in my life, the, this fruit, today may be the day of salvation for you. You have an opportunity. Christ has paid the penalty for those sins on your behalf what you could not do. So if the Spirit is calling you to repent, listen. Listen to him. Be reconciled to God. He has made a way for you. For believers, man, do business with God. If, if you are missing, some of this Spirit is not, some of these fruit is not evident in your life, man, ask the Spirit why. Where, where am I failing to submit 
and then repent and ask him to help. Let's pray. Father, God, thank you so much for loving us. God, for not forsaking us to ourselves. Forgive us when the flesh, Lord, is pulling us and leading us astray and we are following. When the finish line is right in view for us. God, I pray that you would have your way with us today, Lord. And as we leave, Lord, would we rely on the Spirit. We often, God, forget about the Spirit. He is God too. So help Him to remind us to rely on Him. Lord, to crucify the flesh and its passions and not to lead us astray. Lord, for those who may not know you, Lord, I pray today is the day of salvation. Lord, I pray you've been glorified today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're able, please stand and join with us as we sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. Love.